Yes, it is a bit like tag team, making everything sure everything's running and switched, and <clears throat> there we go. I would say, just as before I cut, before we look into God's word this morning, I just thank you for those who prayed for me this week. All I can say is I have never felt so ill. I mean, seriously, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm one of these people who's never ill, normally. You know, a cold lasts me two days, but I have been so ill this week, and I've explained to one or two people the reason why. So let's, let's look, dive in. We're into the church in Corinth. We're into part six. Um, seems like we've been going for a while. Um, if you realize how far we've got, we've only got to chapter five. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it's not going to be quite like Lessons in the Life of Moses. What was that? That was 23 messages. So we'll see how far we get with this. Um, and uh, so we're here on the, uh, the 9th of July, and we're going today, the title I've given today is that righteousness must prevail. And hopefully in September, we'll then pitch into uh, uh, chapter 6, looking at not unto law. So let's just remind ourselves of one or two bits and pieces. If you remember, we're looking at the, uh, the church at Corinth, which came about as a result of Paul's second missionary journey. Um, he wasn't actually going to go there, if you remember, but he got called of God, and he, and he took, came over from Macedonia and visited these, sort of, these churches here, or these towns here, um, visited Athens, Athens being the sort of academic center of the area, and if you like, Corinth, whoops, if we go back, if I hit the laser, there we go. Corinth was a bit like the Las Vegas of the area, okay? Really was not necessarily a very good place. So as we pitch in to the letters, this is the fifth message on the letters that we've got. And so here we go. The reason for Paul writing to them was he was reported on three occasions that there were things not quite right in the church. And in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11 it says, For I have declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Then said in chapter 7 and verse 1 it says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So he had a letter from one household he had another letter which was written by a group of people from within the church. And in 1 Corinthians 16, it says in verse 17, it said, I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunus, and Acacius for what they was lacking on your part. In other words, what hadn't been communicated in this letter, it says they supplied. Some people say it was, it was funds and money. That doesn't fit in the whole context of what Paul has been saying. He, they may well have brought some gifts to him, but actually they brought a report as to what was going on. And he said, for they refresh my spirit and yours, and therefore acknowledge such men, because these were the people who brought the letter back. So you see, we looked at, and it, the letter divides up into a number of sections. There were divisions, and we looked at that. I know, okay, I know one or two people weren't too sure about the phrase groupies, Basically, there were, the church was divided into three, if you like, seating areas. There we go. Um, and one group were following the teaching of one. One group were following a teaching of another. And the others were saying, we were of Christ. And they were at each other's necks, really, over which was right and which was wrong. We had a look at uh, food, and we had a look at the resurrection. And if you remember, we pitched in back in May into that topic of sex. And can I say, I thank those of you who communicated with me after that one. Somebody wrote to me and they said, in all that they're 45 years in the church and going on with God, they've never heard anybody preach on sex in church. Well, I praise God, I'm quite happy to tackle the topic. I mean, if you read through the other chapters, you will see what's coming up. So let's actually pitch into chapter five. Let's reread chapter five. And let's see what God will say to us about what was going on in the church and various bits and pieces. So let's, let's pitch in. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says the following. It's actually reported to me that there is sexual immorality among you. Such sexual immorality has not even been named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. 
For indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, I have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit and the power of Lord Jesus Christ, discover, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. For your glorying is not good. You do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with the sexually immoral or people, Yet certainly I did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, but since then you would not need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what do I have to do with judging those who are outside? Do not judge, do you not judge those who are inside? For those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourself the evil person. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. And as Father, as we sort of pitch into it this morning, we just pray that you'll help us to have a greater understanding of your heart for us as individuals and for your heart for the church. And Father, we just pray that we will have a greater understanding of you as a result. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the key things that I actually felt as we actually read this passage, and I've summarized it in this, in this statement here, is one of the things is that there is a warning about ignoring the holiness of God in the church. If you read it through, one of Paul's hearts for the church is that they will be right before him and holy before him because he is a holy God. If you read in the Old Testament, God did not tolerate anything, did he? It was out of the camp, zap, you were gone, you were dealt with. And God wants us to be a holy and a righteous people. And if we ignore the holiness of God, it actually leads to compromise in our lives. And we can see that all around us. But there are dire consequences of ignoring sin. They were in the church, this particular church, at the church in Corinth, as we said, Paul had been with them 18 months, teaching them everything he knew. He'd only been away for three years, and they were in such a mess. And you see, they were reaching the point where the sin was worse than the sin in the world, as we looked at last time. They were doing things that the world hadn't even thought about or the world wouldn't even do. And that was becoming an increasingly poor witness in Corinth. <coughs> you know, why do, why do we need to get involved in this? The church was supposed to be about changing lives. Whereas here, all they were finding was that within the church, there were compromise going on. And you see... When we look at, in 1 Corinthians 5, we're just going to nip back a few verses. It says the following. It says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together with my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God didn't doesn't leave the church without a way of dealing with these matters. You see, he says, with my spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit and the power of the name of Jesus to allow us to be able to deal with such matters within the church. These areas of compromise. You see, if we were left toolless, then we wouldn't be able to cope, but God says he doesn't do that. And via the Holy Spirit, he gives us the following. And I picked, just picked up four things, and there are some references there you can look at later. You see, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is needed for God's 
discipline within the church. As somebody who's been in the educational field a few years, one of the things is that you get particular students who niggle, 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 niggle. I'm looking across at one of my colleagues who know exactly what they're like. And one of the things that you actually need to do is you need, and we need to have courage to deal with what needs dealing with. You know, if something is not right, then we need to deal with it. And I'll have a look at some warnings about that later on if we don't. You see, we need conviction of the Holy Spirit. One of the things is that uh, if, you ever go, if you ever are in a position where you actually go and speak to somebody and say, look, I'm not sure that's right, what you're doing is right. Interestingly enough, nine times out of ten, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's funny, God told me that too. You know, when, when you go to somebody and say, and maybe you're not pointing the finger, don't forget one finger and how many come back? At least three, you know. When you are involved in dealing with the circumstances or a situation, the Holy Spirit will have gone before you and will have already actually convicted the person. They will know what they were doing wasn't right. We had a case in the church years and years ago where somebody was, um, was expecting out of wedlock, the person was a church member, and we, I was part of the leadership team at that time, and we went to them and we said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cancel your membership. And they said, it's funny you say that, God was telling me I needed to resign and leave. God had already gone before. It's the same thing with prophetic words. If God brings you, gives you a prophetic word for somebody, I always say, it's, you know it's right, because the person will say that confirms what God's already said. You see, also, we need to deal with it in holiness, not in anger. How many of us have got angry over things in the past? Yep, okay, I'm, if I'm the only one, that's fine. <clears throat> I always remember when it came to disciplining our children, the implement of physical discipline, uh, discipline was on the top shelf of a cupboard I couldn't reach without a chair. It meant I had to go and get, physically get a chair. I had to move it across the kitchen. I had to climb up, and I can tell you, if you were still angry, by the time you got to that point, you fell off the chair. You see, we have to deal, and discipline has to be done in holiness and not in anger. And as it says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it talks about... <coughs> but also we need wisdom. And anybody who ever knows, has ever been in a meeting with me, this is my custom prayer, if you like, whenever I go to a meeting, particularly with Christians. I'm involved in a couple of Christian trusts, nine times out of ten, because one, James 1, verse 5 says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally or abundantly I don't care whichever whichever version you're reading but if you come to God and say God I have a circumstance I have a situation here I need to deal with can I have your wisdom the wisdom is abundant and you see we need that wisdom particularly if we're dealing with a Matthew 18 circumstances and situation in discipline but without the power of the Holy Spirit in a disciplined situation, can I say we are acting in the flesh? We're doing it in our strength, and then we fail. And the chances are everybody will, will actually fall out, whereas if we're dealing with the matter under the power of the Holy Spirit, then it works. And you see, one of the things that Christians are not very good at is dealing with things. I bet as Helen and I have been in this church a long time, and one of the things that we've always said is, the problem is if you pile stuff under the carpet, what happens? Eventually the pile gets so high that you fall off the pile and under, stuff underneath the carpet. But you see, the Bible actually talks about that in Ecclesiastes 8. It says, where, um, where Ecclesiastes 8, and I've picked a couple of different versions, in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, it says the following, <coughs> because the sentence against evil work is not executed speedily, 
Therefore, the hearts of the sons of man is the hearts of the sons of men is fully set for them to do evil. In other words, if something's not dealt with, actually it gets worse. I think I probably learnt that in the last week. Probably Friday of last week, when I wasn't, when I felt like somebody had taken all the batteries out, I probably should have got some, some medication at that point and not wait until Monday, by which time I was very ill. I think that's one of the, you know, that's a practical example for me. But let's have a look at the version in the NIV. It says, when sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the people's heart are filled with schemes to do wrong. The Bible says, deal with it, or it'll get worse. (coughs) And I suspect in the church in Corinth, where we found in the beginning of the chapter, where it says, there is a man who is sleeping with his father's new wife. I couldn't remember the relationship. You know, that just didn't happen overnight. You know, things have been going on that probably should have been dealt with before then. And what had happened is it had got worse. And you see, God says, deal with it. And if we look at 1 Corinthians 6, and that first phrase, it says, your glorying is not good. You know, one of the things that we saw in this church is they argued about petty things. (coughs) They were so busy dealing with the bits and pieces and arguing about who they should follow as we looked about the food thing, about whether or not you should eat food offered to idols. Well, it actually wasn't about the food. There was a whole series of principles there. That actually, they were so busy dealing with the petty and arguing and that sort of thing, they actually missed what the enemy was doing in their midst. And you see, they were sort of glorying in the fact that we've got, you know, God's grace is great and we can do what we like. But you see, Paul comes in and he says, doesn't he? He says, your glorying is not good. You do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And what he's saying is that little bit of sin that's got in is going to work its way throughout the whole church. And this was starting to happen, particularly as we look at some of the chapter 6 and we should look at chapter 7. <clears throat> but you see, one of the things we need to understand is how the Jewish people made bread. Now, can I say, I have made, I've discovered bread making probably in the last six months. I was totally convinced I was going to make it in the, in the Kenwood Chef. You know, I was going to knead the dough and I was going to do all the bits and pieces and do all that sort of stuff. Now I bought a bread maker. It's great. And I've learned quite a lot about bread making in the preparation before I decided that actually I was just going to buy a bread maker. I was persuaded. But you see, basically what they did was they weren't able to go to Sainsbury's and buy a little packet of dried yeast. or They didn't have that. So what you did was you kept a bit, this is my understanding, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, they would keep a small amount from their current baking, because it had some yeast in it, put it on one side, and they would use that little bit to get the whole thing going again, if I remember rightly. Anybody remember Herman cake? Do you not remember Herman cake? People would give you a bit of this cake that you'd keep in the fridge, and it would then multiply in the fridge, and the idea was there was far more than you were ever going to have, and you kept giving it to people, and they then put it in their fridges, and it multiplied, and you fed it, and it was just like that. The small bit (coughs) worked its way as you needed the brick, the, the extra flour, needed your way through, And it worked its way through, and then the loaf would rise, and again, you would take in the piece off. Now, leaven in the Bible refers to sin. And you see, they understood the illustration. And what he was saying was, you know, there is sin. It's only little, but if you don't get rid of it, it will get work its way through the whole church. (coughs) Excuse me. So verse 7. Is saying, therefore get rid of the old leaven. And I was looking into Jewish bread making and I understand 
that actually what they used to do was that you could only multiply your yeast so many times before you needed to get some new and say, I'm going to start afresh. And he says here, Paul says, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Saying that when we come to the cross, all of our sin has been dealt with. But you see, what's happened is they were allowed, they had allowed little bits of sin to come in and they'd multiplied and they'd multiplied. And he's referring, because at the time he was writing to them just before the Passover, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And you see, he wanted them to actually purge the church of sin. Any sin whatsoever. Now I discovered this in a little bit of my research, and that is Jewish people today, of course, who are keeping the Passover, get rid of all of the yeast and the leaven in their houses. And I don't know whether you can actually see that, but there are, there are what's called cashiering companies who come into your house to clean your kitchen. I'm not sure I would want them doing that to my nice work surfaces. Um, with blow lamps to burn and make sure all of the work surfaces are completely clean of any leaven. I will stand correct, but that, that, that's what they do in America. But in America, a lot of the kitchens have stainless steel worktops. I'm not sure I want the, my nice kitchen worktops sort of blasted like that with blow lamps. But the point being is, what are they doing? They are purging all of the yeast in the preparation for Passover. And you see, they, they purge with fire. We need to be those who are purged by fire. Purged by the fire of the Holy Spirit. So that if we don't get, if we're not purged, if we don't deal with any of those little, maybe it might be compromises in our lives, then we cannot expect the Holy Spirit to move in a mighty way. Maybe there are historical issues in our lives that we need to deal with, things we've just parked. You know, yeah, I'll deal with that. I'll get to it. And actually, it's become a hindrance to our lives. And Paul then goes on to say, it says, that there, are, there, are, there is a fine line between, between what we say is practice and where we stand in Christ. And let's have a quick look at these, because this might help some of you. You see, our standing in Christ says, the Bible says of us, and we, and we could have gone through all the verses for this, but in Christ we are seated in heaven, but I must admit, personally, I'm dwelling on the earth. You know, I live here. When I go home, I will cook some food. The Bible says we are sinless in Christ. When we have come to him and we've said, Jesus, forgive me my sins, wash me and set me free, the only problem is we live in a world that contaminates us. It has an influence on us. And therefore, yes, we do confess our, we do commit sins. And God says we need to come to him and confess our sins because he is faithful and righteousness to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In Christ, death has no hold. But living on the world... At some point, we are going to submit to death. We are going to be translated from this life to another life. You see, in Christ, we, there, we are completely washed. We are sanctified. But for us on this earth, we must make sure that we purge the leaven on a regular basis. So let's be those who... Let's see if we can be those who actually close the, the gap between our standings in Christ and our daily lives as we live them. So we move on to verse 9, and Paul says the following. He said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. He wasn't referring to those in the world. He was referring to those who were not living righteous lives in the church. When we were on holiday... And I cite this as an example of how, where the world's got to. Okay, I was exercising my dogs in this, uh, some of our house group have seen, heard this one. 
We were exercising, well, the campsite we were staying on, it's a lovely campsite, they have a dog exercising compound, and beside it are these very large earth mounds, which are part of a BMX track. And I was there quite happily minding my own business, keeping an eye on my two dogs, throwing the ball, as you do, just to give them some exercise. And as I, as I walked down past part of this pipe, on one side of this mound, out of sight of the rest of this compound, were a couple of 14 to 16 year old girls making out big time. You know, I tell you, I've been in education for 38 years. I have, these two were really at it. I, you know, and I really wasn't, you know, the dog, I had to keep an eye on the dogs over here. <laughs> but a young lad who was, I would estimate, between he was 12 to 13 years old, he turned around and he seemed, came along the side of the dog compound and I heard him say to these two, he said the following, you don't do that with your cousin. I assume he was referring to his older sister. To which ply the reply came from what I'm describing as a pile of girls. The reply came, it's okay, she's a girl, what's wrong with that? See, that's where the world's at. You know, they just didn't see any problem with what was going on. <clears throat> Fortunately, for me, one of my dogs decided to take an issue with what was going on the other side of the fence and stood there and barked at them. <laughs> She's very discerning, the brown one. But what I'm saying here is, you see, Paul is saying to the, to the church in Corinth, you don't need to keep company with them. The people you need to not keep company with is those who are sexually immoral in the church. And it said in verse 10, it said, Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or the exhaustioners, or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Paul is saying, look, we know what's going on out there. What you need to be dealing with is what's going on in the church. And verse 11 it says, Now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Do not even eat with such a person. Paul is saying not to associate with somebody who is flagrantly sinning or compromising what's going on and refuses to turn from their lifestyle. You see, if we don't deal with the individual or corporate issues of compromise, it will eventually destroy us as well. It will destroy the body. You see, what did Paul say in verse 5? He said, put them out. Why? That they might be saved. What is the purpose of discipline in the church? It's not to make sure we've got a perfectly clean house. Because if we did that, we'd all better leave. It's all about what God is into. Is God is into the restoration business. You know, he's not into the condemnation business. He's into the restoration business. And if we look in Matthew 18, it says the following. Now, this is about sheep. Now, if you remember, when Jesus gave this illustration they would have been laughing their heads off around him because it talks about a hundred sheep what shepherd and let's let's just read it it says what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray does he not leave the 99 and go into the mountains to seek the one that is straying can you imagine the scene among the people in they were all rural people they would have been laughing their heads off at this illustration because if one sheep wanders off, what do you look after? The 99, because they're, they're, they're your profit, aren't they? If it goes off, let it go off. That's fine. Don't worry about that one. Make sure nothing takes your, your 99 that are left. But Jesus doesn't say that, does he? He says you should leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek the one that is straying. That if he should find it, surely I'd say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep over than over the 99 that did not go astray. 
Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. You see, the body should be the place of health and restoration. The whole purpose of this one passage is actually, A, about making sure that the body is safe, but also helping to correct the person who has got it so wrong. Let me put it this way. When you get to the point of turfing somebody out, you know, don't you think that the leaders in the church at that time would have gone to this person and said, look, you know, what you're doing is not right. Because if the people in the world knew about it, the people in the church certainly knew about it. But you see, God, as I said, is in the restoration business. He wants us to be those who are restored to him. No matter what we've done, no matter what we're doing, we need to, he wants us to be in that place. And in 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 12, as we read on, it says, <clears throat> So what do you have to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Those who are outside, God judges. Those who are inside, and it says, those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. This is the last straw. This is the end of the road. But you see, it's not our place to judge the world. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, as I, was, as I was preparing for this, one of the things that I was convicted about and I was praying about was about how we reach our community. As some of you know, the other week I came and uh, we, went, we went on a uh, little walk around the surrounding. I brought my evangelistic tool with me. She opened up four conversations. I, I took my dog for a walk while we were prayer walking, can I say. We had, I think it was four conversations <coughs> with people out there. But I, I came across this illustration. It's not a Christian illustration. It actually comes from Aesop's fables, and I suppose whether or not you... But uh, I thought it was very pertinent at this, for this passage. You see, apparently the north and south wind were arguing about how they would get a man to take his coat off. I don't know whether you've anybody heard this one. I had to go and look it up. It's, and basically, the north wind said, oh, I will get the man to take his coat off. So he blew harder and harder and harder and harder and harder and harder on the man. And what happened? The man did his coat up. So the south wind said, oh, get me have a go. And he blew very gently, but he blew a nice warm wind. And gradually the man got hotter and hotter and he took his coat off. And then he took his jumper off. And in fact, in Aesop's fables, it reaches the point where the man ends up in his birthday suit. And the south wind, south wind winds. And I was sort of thinking about that with regard to what Paul says here. We're not called to have a go at the people who are outside. Well, our, our, our job is to love them and draw them to God and show them the love of God. Show them what holy lives are about, what uncompromising lives are all about. There's an evangelist who is from America who I've, I've, I've met, I've had a chance to listen to, um, and he is rapidly heading for being banned from the UK. Because everywhere he goes he actually turns to the passages in the Bible that refer to sin and points out the sin that the people around him are committing. And people get really upset about that. But if we show people the love of God, they don't tend to get upset. And you see, this is one of the things we need to be. We need to be a people who, A, we've got our own house in order, but B, we are a place of righteousness, we are a place of healing, a place where people can come in and get their lives sorted out and be able to walk in peace with God. And you see, that is why in verse 13 it talked about their own efforts having failed. But in 1 Peter 1 verse 4 it says the following, verse 17, it says, For time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins first... If it begins with, sorry, let's read it again. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? You see, if we get our house in order, we get our compromise dealt with, we get any of those little niggles dealt with, 
God will then use us in a mighty way because people will know that we are a holy people. Saved by God. With our lives cleaned up. And I'm, you know, I'd be the first one to say that, you know, you certainly know what it is like or what, what, whether the old man is still manifesting in the flesh, particularly put me in a queue of traffic or driving to church. We're a little bit late and somebody is only doing 23 miles an hour this morning. <sighs> Never mind. I smiled and I said, Lord, you've still got some work to do. But you see, we need to be those people who are putting those things right so that the little things don't become bigger things that become bigger things that become bigger things that then start to affect what people think of us. So where, well let's, let's, where are we at and what's the challenge for today? A bit shorter than usual. It says, the first thing I would say is, and those maybe watching online and maybe watching later, are we changed... Do we know Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord? Or are we still like the world? Because that's important. Are we living in religion or reality? Religion says, yeah, 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 I'll deal with that. Reality it says, I'll deal with it now. Are we dwelling in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? We are really going to need the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit to deal with issues both individually and corporately. Or are we, are we living in a place of righteousness or are there areas that we have compromised? And if we have, then we need to come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. There's an area of compromise in my life. That's something I should have done. And we need to get it right so that in all things, it doesn't tarnish our witness. Because you'd be surprised how discerning the world are. So let it be that in all things, righteousness will prevail. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you want us to be a holy and righteous people with no areas of compromise in our walk with you, both in what we do and what we say. And Father, we just pray that we will just know your strength and your enabling to allow us to be able to put those things right before you. Father, I pray that you will just not let us off the hook, but that you will just keep on at us until we are that holy and righteous people that, Father, we will then be able to be really good witnesses for you, both personally and corporately. And we just ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But he needs any prayer, then uh, I'm sure Dion and myself are available afterwards. Otherwise, have a nice... There should be some tea, coffee, in a few minutes. Amen.